Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly, episode 400 in support of the EFF, EFF.org forward slash donate. Go donate today. We are here with none other than Mike Poor from In Guardians. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, sir. It's a great pleasure to be on, especially episode 400 and especially in favor of EFF. This uh, interview is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, the creators of the Next Generation Firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at paloaltonetworks.com. Mike, now, you hold a very special place in my heart for a lot of reasons, which some of which we can talk about on the show, some of which we, we won't go there. But... Um, <laughs> The That's okay, Larry will. Larry will, yes. yeah, most definitely. Uh, but I got to be careful because ultimately he's the one that influences the man that yeah. signs my paycheck. Yeah, so. so it's your turn this time, right? <laughs> it is my Strand's turn. Strand's yeah. gone. It's your turn. <laughs> it's my turn. Yeah. So, Mike, you were there at episode one of the show at the bar, coincidentally enough, and uh, you appeared on an interview with Ed Scotus between episode fourteen and fifteen. Uh, so you have a very rich history with the show. So I was uh, very pleased you agreed to come back and uh, help us celebrate our 400th episode. So welcome. Thank you, sir. Well, it's always an honor and a privilege, uh, or at least that's how I feel before the episode. After, you know, it's always uh, it's, yeah, interesting. It's, yeah, the, uh, yeah it, it was interesting because I was trying to, you know, recall uh, kind of the moments leading up to uh, the creation of episode one and, and the creation of the podcast. And, you know, it was kind of early in the cycle of podcasts themselves. And uh, I, I was still out on the whole, you know, do these things have longevity? Do they have a purpose? Do they have uh, a, a kind of a niche to fill? And, uh, well, uh, we've, we've certainly proven that, haven't we? You know, <laughs> yeah. we, uh, we have thousands and thousands of people that rely on, on your show and, and podcasts like it to kind of keep them in touch and in tune with what's going on in the field of information security, uh, both uh, you know what's real, what's rumor, what's conjecture, uh, as well as kind of what products and other techniques are out there right now. So, uh, you know, we thank you for that. Yes. Well, when we thank you as, as well for for teaching the illustrious SANS course, uh, 503 intrusion detection. It's kind of funny that you know, we're getting all nostalgic now. Right? I remember when yeah. Mike was transitioning into uh, to be the lead instructor from that class and had some very big shoes to fill as uh, Marty Rash and Judy Novak and Stephen Northcutt North teach, would teach that class. And I had I'd seen Mike, and they said, that's the guy that's going to teach this class. And I'm like, he must be a pretty special individual yeah. uh, to, to come in and fill those shoes. And you've been teaching that class how many years now, Mike? Uh, it's been uh, 13 years uh, wow. teaching the class. Uh, it's been 11 years leading the uh, track. Uh, you know, it's been a huge honor, you know, especially... Uh, you know, for those of you that got the, the pleasure of seeing the, the holy trinity of IDS, uh, Stephen and Judy and Marty uh, teach the class. Uh, it's uh, uh, huge shoes to fill, as you said. And Stephen is uh, uh, retiring from teaching. Uh, so those of you that got the opportunity to see the master at work himself, uh, consider yourselves fortunate. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, did. I, was, I took that class uh, with the holy trinity. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and Mike, uh, I don't know if you're, you, you probably do remember because we've had this conversation a couple of times. It New was Orleans. New Orleans. <laughs> And uh, yep. you said you don't look good in orange, and we found a. Uh, we went down to uh, one of the, my fellow students, uh, Brett Hiscock. Yes, it's a funny name. Uh, and uh, I went down did to. Did you say Hiscock? Hiscock, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which is okay. Just, interesting. I'm just clarifying. Yep. Larry. Uh, we went uh, down wait, to. Larry, Larry, Street. Larry, Larry remembers Hiscock well. I do. Yeah. <laughs> you went and got what? We went down to Bourbon Street and, and found Hiscock. a t shirt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We found a t an orange t shirt that was a uh, property of uh, New Orleans penal system or something of the like, and orange. we gave it to Mike during exactly. class. Yep. Which he prom probably promptly took home and washed his car with. <laughs> I, I, I drove my vehicle to the car wash wearing it. There you go. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> convertible. Uh, good intention. <laughs> oh, convertible. That so, works. So, Mike, there have been uh, obviously a lot of changes in the IDS, uh, and you cover IPS, I'm assuming, in your, your class now in the past 13 years, right? Yes, sir. What are, um, so, like, what do you talk about in the class today when you – the students come in and they're like, I don't want to be the next Sony and there's all this APT and oh, oh my God. God, cyber and everyone should be drinking. Shut up and drink. Uh, <laughs> so like, how has the class changed in, you know, in the past 13 years to you know, address some of these uh, issues? And I'm assuming you still cover the TCP IP fundamentals and I'm, I'm curious how you 
relate that to a lot of the current threats? Uh, sure. I, you know, I, I think that we've so very recently seen, you know, amazing examples of failure, uh, failure to, you know, identicate, uh, identify, contain, and eradicate uh, some of these actors. And, you know, we feel that, you know, the number one issue is that people aren't looking and they aren't looking in the right places or the right, in the right way. Uh, we've, we've ended up instrumenting our networks to the nth degree, but still we, we fail to reduce or improve the signal to noise ratio in favor of signal. Uh, so a lot of emphasis goes into uh, understanding where IDS fits in, you know, where does it fit in uh, in the threat model. Uh, for us, you know, when we look at it, uh, most organizations still deploy their IDS essentially solely on the perimeter, uh, expecting that IDS to catch all the attacks inbound, outbound, in between inbound. Uh, they end up with, you know, hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of events a day that they have to cover. Uh, they don't have a full-time analysis team. So they're, they're essentially setting themselves up for failure. Most organizations in the U.S. at least deploy IDS simply for compliance purposes, yeah. uh, which, you know, I don't mind. It's a good thing, to, you know, to have a reason to de deploy something that's hard and, you know, not easy to do. But uh, at the same time, since you're required to actually deploy this stuff, you might as well get something out of it and some benefit. So, you know, we, we, we talk about focusing their deployments of IDS, looking for attacks that are likely to succeed in the environments they're trying to protect. So, you know, that, that, that idea of focusing the, the IDS, focusing your deployments, uh, reducing the overall amount of noise and, and improving the quality of the signal uh, of the alerts that you're getting. Uh, and then uh, the next step is figuring out what you're going to do about it. Okay, I found the attackers, I found their, their actions, uh, but, uh, you know, what am I going to do to, you know, contain and eradicate the, the problem? And, and that's, I think, the thing that Sony is facing the most right now. You know, they've had three major wake-ups in the last three years. Uh, and, you know, when they're, when, when they're sitting here right now, uh, they're, they're on a major hunt and destroy mission. And, and we've had clients uh, in the last three weeks desperately trying to get us in uh, to help them on their search and destroy missions uh, to identify, you know, where they've potentially been compromised and stop them from being, you know, essentially the next Sony. So, Mike, one of the things that I struggle with IDS and similar technologies is how you apply that technology to virtualization and cloud. What, what, what's your advice for folks that inevitably must ask that question in your classes? Uh, sure, I, I think that, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm looking at cloud, I think of outsourced virtualization. Uh, so, you know, l let's just touch on the virtualization side for a minute. Uh, when deploying IDS and other technologies for monitoring and virtualization, I believe that the biggest mistake organizations make is either ignoring it uh, and or uh, trying to bridge the physical and virtual gap with IDSs. And what do I mean by that? I don't think that we should be deploying IDSs in virtual space to monitor the physical network. I don't think that we should deploy, be deploying uh, IDSs in the physical network to deploy or to monitor the traffic inside virtual machines, with the exception of deploying IDSs on chassis, uh, like those available from Crossbeam and Cisco, for example, uh, to monitor the virtual space. Uh, what I see a lot of organizations doing is they put up a, a virtual host, a guest uh, machine, for example, uh, with IDS software on there and expect it to keep up and monitor you know, traffic on the physical network via virtual bridge. That, that's where I see the biggest failure. Mm. And that, that is a pretty significant uh, problem to overcome. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I think that, you know, people are also starting to realize that having multiple points of monitoring, even if you're uh, collating them together and analyzing them in a single uh, centralized fashion, uh, gives them much better visibility than having one massive monitoring system trying to capture all traffic. So, Mike, this is Jeff. I if you may interlude it, just ask a question. When you talk about f focused deployments, how focused are you getting? Um, and, and I ask that question just with, with my own experience in mind that, that in some cases in my past uh, uh, experiences, I actually got so focused as to deploy IDS directly on DNS infrastructure, for example. Can you sort of uh, give us a perspective on that? How focused do you actually get in some of your recommendations? Uh, 
That's a great question, Jaffa. I would say, as focused as need be for that particular industry, the big thing is to, to focus the deployment of the IDS and design it so that it's focusing on the alerts that are likely to succeed in that environment. Uh, you know, the, the idea is that, you know, if you look at SourceFire IDS, you know, today, um, you know, they have, you know, over 27,000 signatures uh, available for you. Uh, you know, obviously, we don't need to run them all. Uh, you know, we, in a focused environment, which would be an environment where you actually have good physical connection control, and that's an important distinction, right? Uh, you can focus all you want on, you know, any network that you'd like, but you're really just putting the blinders on the IDS. You're reducing the limit of visibility of what that IDS is looking at. Uh, now, the, the benefit of that, though, is that you have much better signal. Uh, in, in terms of the data you're collecting. If you are just collecting all possible attacks in and out uh, from the network, for instance, uh, there's just such an enormous amount of noise. You know, and to quote my good friend uh, Larry Pesci, uh, you know, it's like finding a needle in a needle stack. So you end up needing to either instrument your network beyond the IDS to point at the right pile of needles to go through, uh, or uh, you have to deploy focused sensors uh, that are really just tuned to picking up things that would likely succeed in that environment. So let's just say that you have a, a screen subnet with your DNS infrastructure, uh, as you mentioned, Joff. Well, uh, you know, on that, net on that network, you might be running that uh, infrastructure on top of uh, Spark architecture, for example, and you might have, be running Bind as your IDS, and, and uh, that might be it in terms of software. Uh, the, uh, so you know, on that particular case, I wouldn't deploy x86 shellcode rules. I wouldn't deploy web IIS rules. I wouldn't deploy Apache rules. I wouldn't deploy your POP3 rules and other things. So you reduce the amount of signatures you're looking at. You improve the performance of the IDS because of that. And in addition, then I would look at augmenting your network by deploying additional things, doing passive DNS analysis, uh, going through and uh, running Bro, for example, and extracting the queries and or other fields uh, so that you can index uh, and find things that you don't have signature coverage for uh, and such. So th that's really kind of the focus of kind of the conclusions of the IDS course these days uh, is trying to improve that signal to noise ratio in favor of signal, trying to focus your deployments so that you can actually have a chance of catching things while not throwing away your perimeter devices, right? You already have those. Uh, and those are the devices that you're going to go to, you know, from a videotape perspective to try to find all events to and from within a threshold of time. But I wouldn't spend my analysis dollars on those machines. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting point. I was about to come around to that. Just because you focus an IDS deployment in a particular application space or a particular infra infrastructure need doesn't mean you throw away, per se, your uh, umbrella type uh, deployment, um, it, it's more, I think, in my opinion anyway, more of a complement, um, not a replacement. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's just you need that videotape capability um, to be in place as that, that sort of second level of analysis, if you like, the focused IDS deployment to, to, to more look, look uh, more tightly at that, uh, the critical assets. Uh, the well, and, and I think that the, the same could be said for any kind of large amount of collection of data. Uh, you know, you, you look at, for instance, uh, you know, let's say a defense contractor lab, right? You've got uh, parking lot cameras, you've got uh, entry logs, you've got man trap logs, you've got uh, RFID, you know, and door lock logs and, and everything else. And, you know, in reality, you have uh, folks monitoring all these types of things, but if something were to happen, you know, in the heart of that organization's, you know, R&D lab, for instance, where they stored all that data, uh, the, the first logs that you'd want to go to would be, you know, the logs directly around the data that was responsible uh, or that you were responsible for covering, uh, not necessarily the parking lot cameras. So uh, you'd go back all the way through and see the access logs and the parking lot cameras as well. Uh, but uh, you'd really want to see who accessed the lab, who accessed the data, uh, you know, under what user accounts uh, or what personnel uh, credentials were used and those types of things. Yeah, the thing I found, I, I think, is that uh, when you have a focused deployment uh, in the IDS space, um, it enables you uh, to, be, uh, to, to reduce that time span, to be a little less um, purely reactive. 
uh, because you get those alerts that are that are specifically focused on that application. Whereas, as as you're saying in the in the sort of video camera scenario, the the sort of umbrella uh, deployment. Um, that's your post analysis space typically the, uh, mm -hmm. where you where you're coming back and going okay well let's zoom out and and look at this event uh, from a more uh, global perspective uh, and you know let's just break it down and that's when you're going to go to the video camera uh, would you would you agree with that assessment yeah there are way too many triggers on your perimeter uh, for you to actually have use them as actionable intelligence you, you know yeah. if you will uh, but you know on that focus sensor deployment uh, you know, when it hits close to heart with an attack that is likely to succeed, that's when you want to action uh, your uh, your team to you know, hunt and destroy. Yeah. yeah. So, Mike, you you mentioned uh, the the Bro uh, IDS, which I think the IDS kind of moniker attached to Bro is slightly off. Uh, when we interviewed the, I agree. The, yeah, <laughs> the Bro developers, they kind of said it's it's. It's like a, a scripting or grep kind of language for your network. And having mm -hmm. said that, how do you recommend people tune and create rules for Bro to not just tech detect uh, intrusions, but maybe vulnerabilities, maybe malicious activity? Like, what are some of your recommendations there for Bro deployments? So uh, I don't run Bro as an IDS on my networks. Uh, you know, I, I would treat my Bro much more from a consulting perspective as an incident response tool. Uh, something to go in, instrument the network, identify uh, the you know potential vectors of compromise, uh, and capture all network activity that might be related. For example, uh, so you know, on one side of this type of tool, you have uh, something like. You know, Cisco's NetFlow, uh, JFlow, SFlow, uh, Silk with NetworkFlow, Argus. Next, uh, essentially, network transactional logging. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can only go so far because primarily they're logging this IP to that IP, this port to that port, and this much data for that amount of time. So Bro, on the other hand, is, uh, as I see it, a programming platform for network collection and analysis. So... Uh, you're sitting there, you're monitoring a network, you're collecting data, it's uh, monitoring connections, it's monitoring number of packets, bytes, uh, sent, start time, end time, but also it's able to collect pretty much anything you'd like, right? You know, by default it's going to go and analyze protocols that you know, like HTTP, grab uh, the, uh, uh, the URIs, uh, client and server responses and so forth, uh, and log those, uh, DNS queries and log those. And then provide you with a platform that you can go through and analyze them on your own. Then you can do some more advanced kung fu, like uh, look for portable executables being transferred across the wire, grab them, save them off, upload them to Cuckoo Sandbox, and get the report back. I mean, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, so uh, uh, I, too, don't view Bro as an IDS. I view it as a network platform for uh, both collection and analysis of events. Yeah, it's cool. interesting. It, we you, we marvel at that technology, and you know, getting that out on an enterprise scale is very difficult. And often the, yeah. you know, when I talk to larger enterprises, they're like, "Well, you know, we're getting all this data. What do we do with it, and how do we report to management?" So, how do you, what are your recommendations for those larger organizations that have, you know, twenty thousand or more endpoints in fifty or more branch offices, and just have this massive amounts of data? Is it more people? Is it more technology? Like, where's the balance, and, and what can they report to management? Uh, well, I, I think their, better, their balance is going to be much more between legal and operations, right? Uh, legal is driving this collection uh, of data, yet legal is the one responsible for dealing with the risk of having all this data that they're collecting. Uh, the operations uh, is tasked with collecting all this data, but operations really doesn't get any, any real benefit out of collecting this data because most of the time they don't analyze it. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, you know, personally, I think that it is, uh, to use one of my favorite words uh, uh, coined, I believe, by Marty Resch, it's befuckering to me that these organizations <laughs> are co collecting <laughs> all this data. Oh, that's, good fucking, gets, that's a good fucking plan. That, yeah, <laughs> befuckering. I, I, I like that. I, <laughs> Uh, just, but, but it truly I'm is the hashtag collecting this right data now. and then not analyzing it. I think that organizations need to turn the tide and start analyzing this data from an operations perspective, meaning mm -hmm. performance, uh, stability, uptime, uh, and from a business analytics perspective, meaning you know efficiency in business, uh, eliminating the, the losses that they're having in business due to, due to uh, fraud and other things, as well as security. I think security should be an afterthought. 
uh, you know, it has been an afterthought, but the problem is that they're not thinking about it. Uh, you know, I, I think that we should focus on, you know, improving network performance, improving business and operations performance. I think that we should be uh, focusing on these things and have security be the added benefit that comes from actually looking at those logs. Uh, unfortunately, I think that people are missing the ball, uh, you know, with this. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, a lot more companies are going to be completely... Uh, screwed uh, by being hacked in the way that Saudi Aramco was hacked, in the way that you know Sony was hacked. Uh, you know, you're seeing each one of these verticals starting to have their wake up and smell the coffee moment. Uh, you know, I mean, w when it comes down to it, from the Sony perspective, uh, and, and a lot of people really aren't talking about this at all. It's about jobs. Uh, you know, you, you have hundreds of thousands of people uh, in the California economy, for example, that rely uh, on the entertainment industry. Uh, and when, when, when this kind of thing happens, regardless of the actors responsible, regardless of whether it's, uh, you know, our little brother Kim uh, in uh, North Korea calling the shots, which I seriously doubt, wh whether it's their big brother China who are calling the shots and have the capability to do this, uh, I still doubt that. Well, you know, whether it's a, a U.S. government entity or agency that's calling the shots on this kind of thing for their own benefit, who knows and who cares? It's still about jobs at the end. It's still about the fact that Sony went out uh, and hired uh, thousands of people in the security space. They built three socks. Uh, they, uh, you know, brought in you know big organizations to help them out, and they still got screwed. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, they could have done better. They definitely could have done better, and they could have responded better. But still, uh, you know, when you get organizations like HB Gary, you know, getting you know hacked and squashed. If Greg Hogland can be hacked. Any one of us can be hacked. I mean, the guy's one of the smartest people in our industry. Aaron Barr notwithstanding. So, interesting. Um, so, Mike, uh, I want to talk about, uh, with along that topic, how the Sony hack impacted the industry. And I, I didn't have time to ask that some of our other guests today. But what's your assessment as to how this particular breach has impacted the entertainment industry? Well, I, I, th I think, you know, one of the biggest things is that, you know, jobs are going to roll because of this. Uh, people are, uh, you know, when, when a company like Sony loses, you know, a, a huge percentage of its stock value, uh, what ends up happening is that people are going to lose their jobs, right? Uh, you have uh, organizations within this industry, uh, the entertainment field, we have a number of clients in that space. Uh, and this particular industry has a tendency to, buy up movie studios and movie houses and they have a lot of internal competition and internal siloing. So, you know, with, with a number of these organizations right now, they are so kind of uh, fragmented in the way that they're structured, meaning they have very little centralized security, very little centralized logging of data and, uh, and oversight, uh, that uh, they, they have to be petrified, I think. Uh, petrified of losing their jobs, petrified of What's going to happen next? Uh, I think if you look at, you know, the softer topics of, you know, whether they should have caved into these requests and removed the, uh, uh, you know, the movie from either, you know, publishing it, it or, uh, uh, you know, or some people are suggesting if they should release it, you know, for free online. Uh, I think it's a very scary position to be in. Hasn't that kind of been done already? <laughs> What's that? Isn't the movie kind of out there already? Wasn't that uh, one of the things know. stolen? Uh, I think the movie was stolen, but the movie it itself, I, I believe, is not online. Hmm. The, uh, but I haven't looked. Because that would be against the law, right? That's right. <laughs> no, that's not why I haven't looked. I just uh, got home yesterday from Sands. I'm really tired, and I really don't care. I think the last part. I think the last part is the ultimate answer to that: is that I really don't care. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, I am watching Team America over and over again on repeat. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, uh, so Mike, I want to step back a little bit to the Sands class, and I and I, you know I sort of hate to do that, but a little bit. But um, I, I took the class back when it was called Track Three, mm -hmm. and wow, Larry, you're old. Yeah, I am. Uh, yeah. And you know, quite honestly. At the time, it was one of those, those those times in my career where the company was not willing to pay for certifications and so forth. Uh, I, personally, I'd love to go back to take your class and 
get the certification for it. But the question is, in what? Heckle, can what? you get a discount? It, reg- regardless, of, could. <laughs> regardless of whether I can get a discount, regardless of whether or not I'd heckle, because of course both of those would probably be the case. I would probably get a discount and I'd probably heckle until Mike refused to sign my paycheck. Um, what has changed over s- those so many years with IDS IPS aside from it being dead? <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> he had to throw that in. He had to throw that in there, right, right, Mike. I did. I, I was going to ask that, too. Uh, Is IDS dead? But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find it funny because uh, Steenan, who wrote that uh, vile report uh, back in the day, uh, keeps trying to friend me on Facebook. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> really? Seriously? Uh, but, uh, you, know, uh, uh, for, you know, first of all, you know, from a class perspective, uh, Judy Novak rewrote the class uh, from scratch uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, so, you know, the class is kind of uh, all new, which is really cool. Awesome. Uh, the, um, nice. uh, I felt that originally our first three days, which were so much fun and so interesting, uh, were uh, a little disjointed. Uh, you know, I figured that if we're going to teach people networking, we should st- teach them from the bottom of the stack up uh, and move from there. So we reorganized the class that way, which has been phenomenal, while teaching them both uh, the BPF filtering language as well as uh, teaching them uh, Wireshark display filters and how to use Wireshark, you know, in in Kung Fu and so forth, which has been great. Uh, the, um, we've added uh, a ton of new uh, tools uh, and methods uh, with, uh, you know, obviously Bro uh, was added. It was added uh, very strategically uh, about six months prior to uh, Source Fire being acquired, so that worked out really nice for us. Uh, you know, in the case that Cisco wanted to, for instance, close Source uh, Snort uh, or something like that, uh, we had, you know, a backup without having to go to Suricata. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> wow. Nice. That was a, so, a, a, a digestive moment, you know. Yeah. Or an purely, indigestive moment. Purely. Something like that. Yeah, oh, uh, Jesus. My bad. I keep forgetting I'm on video. Uh, the, uh, or right. something Jeff like that. Jeff keeps forgetting to not lean back. Yeah, I know this chair. Every time I lean back, it's like, woo. <laughs> You, oh, you know, if yeah. you push if you push the adjustment lever in, it won't let you lean back, and that's you don't fall down. That's what she. Yeah, said. but I don't like that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry, we sorry, totally sorry. just uh, Mike. Go ahead, sorry, Mike. Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Mike. S- says the man in the fur line outfit. <laughs> 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 yeah, how's how are you gonna take that seriously? Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. Which reminds well, me, uh, don't forget, uh, if you ever get near me, I got I got a Brazilian place to take you to. Sounds good. Sounds, Sounds good. Sounds like the challenge is been I've thrown. got a Brazilian for you too, pal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, baby. Oh, oh baby. Yeah. Yeah. All right, right. That, just, <laughs> that, that is going to be a sweeper that will live in infamy yeah. on Security Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When yeah. beards collide. <laughs> yes. When you, beards you, uh, collide, yeah. Uh, you're recording this? Oh, yes. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... Where are, you ready? are you ready? Where the hell were we? Are you ready, <laughs> are you ready to play? Is, is, no, no, is wait, IDS dead? I, I, not yet. Not yet. No, no, no. We're real, real quick, but I got one. So uh, arguably, in, in my opinion, if we can switch back to Mike's shot, that would be great. Um, <laughs> arguably, Mike has got the second most interesting background behind mm. him in all of our podcast history. And, Mike, I hate to say it, the first one was uh, Don Murdoch, and he had posters of VeggieTales hanging behind Mm -hmm. him um and you appear to have a bunch of masks and a picture that we can't see behind hanging behind you could you tell us a little bit about that uh well uh, i've had a a collection of masks going on for about 20 years uh and uh these masks in particular are masks from uh, mexico from the states of guerrero and oaxaca uh, they are uh, approximately 40 to 50 years old, uh, originally collected by my aunt when uh, her husband was the ambas- U.S. ambassador to Mexico. Uh, they're anthropomorphic masks uh, that, uh, well, you know, are very common from that area. Uh, they started off as kind of gifts for kids and other things as Christmas, uh, since Mexico is the most surreal state on the planet. <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, a number of our masks are Mexican, uh, but uh, we, we have... Uh, Polynesian, uh, Hawaiian, uh, Indonesian, uh, as well as Tibetan masks. Very cool. I think the, that uh, my my prize mask uh, is uh, a mask, a Tibetan mask that is the monster of impermanence. He is the monster that holds and spins the wheel of life. 
Very cool. Can did you show it to us? <clears throat> did you <laughs> did you uh -oh. want to wear that mask for five there questions, Mike? There we go, and Wait, it's over the fireplace. Very cool. Nice. There you go. Very cool. So, Mike, are you ready to play five questions? I've That's always true. been ready to play five questions. I have no idea what that is, but I'm assuming you're going to ask me five questions. I am going to ask you five questions. Three words to describe yourself. Big red sexy, as always. <laughs> oh, yes. You were the first one today to use sexy in that description. I'm so glad you did. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? My teeth. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Dr. Jones. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Second. Pick two celebrities to be your parents. Dead or alive. Sean Connery and Angelina Jolie. Oh! oh! So we've got a fourth <laughs> for Angelina. Yeah, and uh, Mike, I will add that you are the fourth person today to add uh, answer G Angelina Jolie as and mom. And I will say that has to be a record on Security Weekly for the fastest five questions answered ever. Yeah, yeah, yes. Definitely. Wait, bueno. definitely. <laughs> Good job, Mike. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for appearing on Security Weekly. Always nice to have you on the show. We wish you the best. Take care, Mike. Thank you. And uh, please don't be a stranger from episode 14 that long again. Actually, please don't be a stranger, Mike. It's, it's <laughs> great talking to you again. Cheers. With Thanks, that, sir. we're going to take a short break, come back with Michael Santar Colangelo and talk about some breaches. I got a little fun kind of quiz game going on with breaches that uh, Michael's going to answer. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. <laughs>